start by thanking the ORF uh, for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Turn this one. For giving me the opportunity to give this talk, and particularly to Lena for contacting me and asking me to uh, give this talk. I should also like to thank Spenta for his introduction and also for having given most of my talk. So <laughs> you already heard all of, heard it. However, I'll try to give you, show you some pictures and keep you amused for the next part of the hour or so. But uh, okay, so uh, can we have the lights up? This, these lights up because maybe for first front half. Is this okay for the so? So uh, my talk is going to be on the discovery of the Higgs boson and uh, why it is in some sense a watershed in our understanding of the universe. So but first things first, uh, this is a collection of some uh, news clippings. You all see news clippings on the newspapers and the media and so on and uh, you will notice a common theme running through them which is that is a very, it's common and popular to call this the God particle. Oh, thanks. thanks. So it's common to call this the God particle. So let's clear this business from the beginning. That, right into at once. Excuse me, so, ah. right. So the media, love to describe the Higgs boson as the God particle, you've seen that. However, uh, let me tell you that it has no more to do with God than electrons, protons, etc. And therefore, in fact, the name originated from a silly joke by Leon Lederman, who I think must be regretting what he has done. So, uh, basically he wrote a book which he, where he, about the Higgs, where he called it the goddamn particle. And it was the goddamn particle because it was goddamn difficult to find. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in every country, there are extremists from the right wing. And uh, he was a, the publisher or the editor said that if you do this, then our, you will have people picketing our offices. And uh, we don't want that. So get rid of the damn and get rid of the picketers. So you're left with the god particle. And Lederman said, okay, in a sense, you know, God is difficult to find, Higgs is difficult to find, let it be. <laughs> so, okay, so having done this, so that is what he's unleashed on us. However, after that, the, it has become, uh, well, we have not yet reached this stage, okay. But uh, <laughs> perhaps it will happen at some stage. So I'm, I'll show you a cartoon which I found on the internet, which I liked very much. And that says, let's say, God particle, one more God time, time. And so, so for the rest of this talk, it's going to be about the Higgs boson. No more God particle. So let's come to the real issues. So, of course, everyone already wants to know what is the Higgs boson. So I'll talk about that. Then, you must be wondering why it proved so difficult to find, and I hope that will come out as, uh, as I keep talking, why uh, it was so difficult. And then, what, we, what did we really do to eventually find it? Then, you would like to know whether we have really found it, and what further tests we require to make, to be sure that we have found it. And uh, finally, if it is the Higgs boson, where does that leave us? So, I'll spend most of the talk, in fact, talking about the first item, which is explain to you what the Higgs boson is, and a little bit, and it's sort of, be sort of less as we go, but I'll have something to say about each issue. Okay, so let's, be, let's begin at the beginning. The beginning means the real beginning. So some 14 billion years ago, as we think now, the universe was created in an explosion which is now known as the Big Bang. And then we had this fireball starting from a point, and that expanded. And as it expanded, it kept cooling. So we know that things when they expand, they cool. And as it cooled, all these structures formed. 
and we began to see galaxies and uh, other beautiful structures and till now this is what you see. Look up at the night sky, well not Bombay, you have to go outside Bombay to see this, but uh, you do see this and the temperature has now fallen to something very close to absolute zero which is minus 273 degrees, so it's just a little bit above that, but still what you see is the relic of what happened at that time. Now, this cooled down an ancient now universe, it's full of the most weird and lovely structures and uh, I'll show you a few pictures of those. This is of course not a picture but a simulation or really the result of a study of the infrared survey of the whole sky. And these little dots here are galaxies and little, so you see that there are very interesting structures all over the universe and we don't know exactly, we have some understanding but we don't know exactly why these originated. Then of course, look deep into the sky, you would see such objects. Some of these are, uh, is there a point? <coughs> So, yeah. So some of these uh, nice things are nearby stars, and then these are galaxies, or other things, galaxies, and so on. Then here is a wonderful example of two galaxies colliding with each other, be getting distorted. Yes, I could do that perhaps. No, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. So then here is this is. There are some of the beautiful structures. I only want you to appreciate the beauty of these. And this is a mock-up of our galaxy. And this is what it would look like if you went on top of it and looked at it. This slid rotating. And there's a, there's a black hole somewhere in the center. And then we have the sun somewhere on top of these arms. So, now all these structures now they seem to have evolved over these 13.8 billion years under the action of one force and that is gravity. So all, what created all these beautiful structures is nothing more or less than the same force which makes the moon go around the earth. The same force which would make a piece of uh, wood or something which I drop fall to the ground and it's, this, it's the same force which itself is pretty wonderful that uh, a force as familiar to us as gravity and uh, can actually create all of this. However, the important thing is that we know that gravity, Just the yeah. so gravity, we know that it acts differently on different objects because they have different mass. So you put two things in a balance, you know that one goes up, one goes down, and all of this happens because the mass is different. So therefore, in a sense, it is mass which rules the universe. It is mass which, cause, which causes the different structures to come up and it's sort of a very fundamental thing which allows the universe to look as it is looking today. So what is this mysterious mass? Like uh, most things, we need to go back to Sir Isaac Newton to understand what is mass. So from our everyday experience, you know that if you take an object and apply a constant force to it, then as the time goes, the object moves faster and faster. However, it's also our common experience that some of them move, start moving pretty fast and for some of them it's very difficult to get them to move at all. And what makes the difference is the mass. So just to take, a, take an example, try pushing a car with all your force and you'll find it moves very slowly. But on the other hand, take the same amount of force and push a person with that and the person will of course go flight. So there is a difference in mass and this is what Newton pointed out, that the real difference between this is what we call mass. However, there is a little more to mass than this, that the, once you take relativity, there is a concept of the mass changes when a particle moves. So there is a mass which you have at rest and a mass which is there in motion. So again, I'll draw a similar plot and what happens is that if you take the energy and the momentum and you plot the momentum and keep decreasing the momentum, at one point the momentum becomes zero and the particle has comes to rest. But at that time it still has a certain amount of energy which is called the rest energy and which is given by this uh, 
apart from the scale factor of c squared is given by m naught or the rest mass. There are also particles. It's possible to have particles. Classically, it's not possible to have particles with zero mass, but relativity allows you to have particles which have zero mass. Why? Because, of course, as soon as it moves, it generates a mass. So it has a mass after all, but you can't bring it to rest. So, in fact, a massless particle can only move at the speed of light. So these are some of the results of relativity. Now, let's go back to the early universe. So I'm sort of showing you a cartoon with only three particles, but of course there were not three particles, but zillions of particles. I can't draw all of them on the screen. So now all these particles initially were massless, and they were sort of flying around at the speed of light. So all over the universe, and everything was going at the speed of light. Now, if you have massless particles going at the speed of light, then clearly you can't form structures. Okay, structures form only when two things slow down, come together, are bound together. However, if everything is flying away at the same speed, you can't form structures. So, had the universe continued like this, then we would never see all the beautiful structures I showed you. We would never have those. We would only have particles still flying around at the speed of light. Okay, with less energy, but still at the speed of light. Now, I need to introduce you to one more terminology that in quantum theory, we don't distinguish between a continuous field and between a swarm of particles. They are in some sense identical. This is not difficult to understand. You think of the sea, which you can probably see from one of, the, one of these windows. And of course, when you see it, it's a vast continuous thing. You see waves in the sea. However, we all know that it's ultimately made up of little molecules of water, which are like little particles. So this huge swarm of particles looks like a sea. And similarly, when we talk, when I'm going to talk about the early universe, I'm going to talk about different kinds of fields. So this expanding cooling universe was full of such fields. There were electron fields, muon fields, photon fields, things, whatever, whatever you have. And all these, so, yeah. so all these consisted of swarms of particles flying around at the speed of light. That's our picture of the very early universe. But, about a very small time on the on our everyday scale, but a pretty long time for the so far as the expansion of the universe is concerned, about 0 0.01 nanoseconds after the Big Bang, one of these fields, which today we call the Higgs field, underwent what we call a phase transition. Okay, so it changed its nature and effectively it became sticky. Okay, now this is in fact the phase transition which Penta talked about. He talked about a superconducting phase transition. And I don't want to, uh, I won't go into the details unless you can ask me later if you want to know about technical things. So effectively, this uh, one field developed this sticky property. Now, what is a phase transition? We are familiar with phase transitions. Okay. You are familiar with what happens when ice becomes water or the other way around. And the nature of the subject, of the material changes a little bit. We are familiar with that. However, the ice water transition is not a very good example because there is heat exchanged. The better example is the ferromagnetic phase transition where you go for, when you take a magnet, a magnetized object, keep heating it, at some stage the magnetization goes away and it changes from a ferromagnet to a paramagnet. So there no heat is, uh, so this uh, change was something like that. So a spontaneous change occurred because of the cooling. We went below some critical temperature. And a spontaneous change happened in the Higgs field. And it developed this sticky property, quote unquote sticky property. Now, just imagine this is a cartoon of the Higgs field. And think of a massless particle, one of the many massless particles, which does not interact with the, or doesn't stick with the Higgs field. So if it doesn't stick with the Higgs field, then it just flies around as it was flying around previously, very fast, at the speed of light. It doesn't care. However, a particle which interacts with the Higgs field <coughs> will now be sticking to that field and will have sort of little bits of Higgs sticking to it. And as it moves through, it will move much slower. So this is somewhat in the way that if you, if you wear shoes and walk through mud, 
and the mud sticks to your shoes, then your shoes become seen heavier and heavier. So this is a similar phenomenon. If you couldn't see the mud, then of course you would think that your shoe for has developed some mysterious property, it's become heavier. And if a particle which interacts very strongly with the Higgs field, of course now has a big burden, so it's like a ship with a lot of barnacles which cannot move through the sea. So it's somewhat like that. So what we find as a result of this is that suppose we couldn't see the Higgs field, as we knew exactly the same particles at exactly the same speed. So suppose you couldn't see the Higgs field, what would you say? This particle is massless, so it's zipping around at uh, the speed of light. This guy is sort of light, this guy is heavy. So what we can say about mass is that it's an external attribute of a particle because it's coming from the Higgs field, it's not coming from the particle itself. However, so long as you can't see the Higgs field, it appears intrinsic and this is what Newton had seen, what Einstein had seen. So, so this is uh, the picture we have. So this collective picture is called the Higgs mechanism and I have here a galaxy of uh, brilliant people to whom we all owe for this idea and uh, pictures are color coded, the black and white ones are of those who gave the original groundwork ideas and the actual idea we owe to these six gentlemen of whom Bro is no longer with us but uh, these two people wrote one paper together, Peter Higgs wrote his paper separately and these people wrote a separate paper, all of them had the same idea which is of this phase transition which gives mass to all the known particles. So that's the that's the uh, giving credit to the people who we but Now, of course you will ask this question. So I really like this picture. It's that of a bushman from the Kalahari Desert who has just been told that diseases are due to invisible objects like bacteria and viruses and they're not due to witchcraft. And you can see from his expression that he's not very convinced. So, so why should we not be like this bushman and say, okay, this is a very nice theory, and, uh, but why should I believe you? Okay, so we want some proof. So in fact, this is where Mr. Peter Higgs comes into the story. So Higgs himself told us the story that, uh, in fact, he, he, he repeated the story on the 4th of July, that uh, when he wrote up his paper, Apparently, he sent it to the well-known European journal Physics Letters and the editor, the referee returned it to him with precisely this statement. How do I know that this is not physics and not metaphysics? Why is it not a good theory? Why, what, what would you do to prove it? So very tentatively, so he thought it up and then he, for some reason he didn't want to send it back to Physics Letters. He sent it across the Atlantic. He sent it to the US to the Physical Review Letters with one comment about what the physical properties could be. So I'll show you that. But let me explain it first. The point is very simple. That this Higgs uh, field, not only does it uh, stick to other particles, but it can stick to itself. It has this property. And therefore, it can sort of form a clump of itself, okay, which will behave like a particle. Again, if you take the analogy of mud sticking to a boot, Okay, that's not difficult because if mud can stick to a boat, it can also stick and you can take a ball of mud and roll it along and then that looks like a particle. So if you don't see the Higgs boson, then such a, see the Higgs field, then such a clump would behave like a particle. It would carry energy and momentum around and then you would call it a Higgs boson. The reason why you call it a boson is that it has spin zero. Okay, but that's a technical matter. I'll uh, briefly touch upon it later. So when Higgs wrote up his famous paper, that he wrote it in language which uh, is only an expert can understand and that's because being extra cautious. He wrote that an essential feature is the prediction of incomplete multiplets. I don't know to explain what that is. But, but this is essentially what it is. You start with a, with, with a set of fields like this and these are sort of get absorbed and become look like masses and you're left with this incomplete multiplet and he says of course that means that you're going to see that. So this very tentative statement is really a statement that you are going to see a Higgs boson. Okay, so that's the, so scientists are generally very cautious. I'll give another example of a cautious statement when we come later. But 
Essentially, this is what he meant. And uh, in the 1966 Rochester Conference, Benjamin Lee, a well-known American uh, scientist, he started calling this the Higgs boson, and that name has stuck ever since. So there. Uh, all right. Now, we'll fast forward to the next year, when Abdul Salam, Stephen Weinberg, they together, they or independently, they combined the theory of Higgs and the others with there was already there existed a theory of which unified the, the weak nuclear interaction with the electromagnetic interaction. And this unification, so this was a nice theory, but the result of the theory was that everything was massless. You needed to give mass. So now that you knew from Higgs and others how to give mass, so when you combine these, you created what is called the standard model of electromagnetic interactions. So this is Weinberg, you already heard his quote from uh, Spenta, Glashow, and Abdul Salam. So. However, so this standard model, which people have constructed, you have to realize that the Higgs boson is the capstone of the standard model. Remove the Higgs, everything collapses. There is there's no working model. So the Higgs boson is essential. And therefore, since the 1960s, we have been hunting for this Higgs boson. All right, so before I proceed further, let me take the opportunity to pay tribute to two great scientists whose names keep figuring, but of course were not directly involved. One is the, so, the, so sort of the colors are not very clear, but these particles on the top of the arch, these are bosons, they have spin, uh, all of them, this has spin zero and these have spin one, they have integer spin, and they are named after Satyendranath Bose. And the other particles which we have, the quarks and the leptons, are named after Enrico Fermi, who uh, is the, uh, so these are the two people after whom they are named. However, I think that is the only connection they have with this uh, story, that these kinds of particles are named after them. But it's good to pay tribute to them. Okay, so now that we know that there is a Higgs boson, or there should be a Higgs boson, where to look for the Higgs boson, and how to look for the Higgs boson. So, when this was proposed, so this is a complicated subject. It is so complicated that people have even written a textbook about it. Okay. And, uh, in fact, when I was doing my PhD, this was my standard, almost my standard bedtime reading that uh, you had to know. And it's, it's a fairly fat, it's a fat uh, book with lots, lots of details. Okay. So, it's sort of irrelevant now because we found the Higgs. But uh, in the 80s, it was not the trouble is that the standard model does not predict the mass of the Higgs boson. It doesn't tell us exactly what the mass should be. So, if you go from a scale of 0 to 1 tera electron volt, which is about uh, 1100 times the mass of a proton, so the Higgs boson the standard model says the mass can be anywhere in between. There are some quantum corrections which don't allow you to actually have these large masses. So, somewhere around 0.7 is the maximum we can go. In the early days, people also thought that if all the fermions are light, you could have a bound up to 7 GeV. 7, uh, that is giga electron volt is 1000 of this. So, if this is 1000, then this is 7. However, later it was, it found that there is a heavy fermion called the top quark, which is uh, heavy. So, and therefore that bound gets washed out. So, truly we knew nothing about the, theoretically we knew nothing about the mass, except that it is somewhere from 0 to 700 about the mass, the mass of the Higgs boson, of the Higgs boson itself. We know that the Higgs boson gives mass to all the other guys. Whose <coughs> mass we know. However, we don't know what the mass of the Higgs boson itself is, except that we know that it has a mass. All right, so now this, searching in this huge region is like saying that there's a tiger somewhere in this jungle far away and find it. And that is in fact what we did. Now, uh, of course, if I ask, or if any of us is asked to do this job, we will say it's impossible, we can't find it. But go to a shikari, and he will tell you the tricks of the trade. So he will tell you, okay, for example, that uh, if there is a tiger, the fellow has to come and drink water. So presumably you, you hang around near the watering hole, and he will come there. So again, you have to look for the characteristics of the Higgs boson. I'll keep going on with this analogy because it's pretty apt. 
Uh, so, the point is that the Higgs boson doesn't live very long. I mean, that's an understatement. Its lifetime is only 10 to the minus 21 seconds. So, very, almost immediately after it's created, it decays into lighter particles. Now, these particles also decay into particles which are even lighter. And this goes on until we have some combination of stable particles. So this combination of stable particles is what you look for. And you call it a Higgs candidate event. So when you produce a Higgs boson, it doesn't appear as a Higgs boson. It appears only as this final debris of the decays. But those debris have a definite pattern. And it is that pattern which we look for. And that pattern which is going to tell us whether there is a Higgs boson or not. Now, one other property, which is obvious, sort of, is that the Higgs boson will interact or stick more strongly with the heavier particles. The heavier the particle, the stronger its interaction with the Higgs. And we expect that because, of course, we know that that is how the particles got their mass, by sticking more strongly to the Higgs. So therefore, the heavier it is, it will stick more strongly to the Higgs boson. Now, sorry, the scale has sort of disappeared. It's sort of barely visible at the bottom. However, this is the scale of the heavy of the particles in the standard model. And the Higgs will essentially couple only to these heavy, heaviest ones. So to the W and Z, to the top quark and the bottom quark, and finally to the tau lepton. So they're, they're basically these five which it couples too strongly. So if you take a Higgs boson, then if it's heavy enough, it will either decay to a pair of top quarks, top quark, anti-quark pair, or to a pair of W bosons or Z bosons, or to a pair of bottom quarks or tau leptons. <coughs> and then there are quantum effects, very small quantum effects, which allow it to decay to a pair of gluons or to a pair of photons. So I won't have much to say about most of these decays, except a few. So, however, the probability of decaying to all of these is not the same. In fact, if you take the probability and you make a plot of that probability against the mass of the Higgs boson, then you see that for different probabilities, for low values, for example, most of the time it will decay to a BB bar pair. For high values, most of them it will go to a WW pair. And then there are some crossovers and so on. And of course, now with the benefit of hindsight that we know that the mass is about 125 GV, so this is where we really stand. So it goes maximum to BB bar and so on, and to these. So I'll show you a pie chart. So these are the basically the decay modes of a 125 GV Higgs boson. I'm now jumping the gun a little bit because uh, we didn't know till recently that the mass is 125 GV. But if it is, then you see that most of the time it goes to BB bar pairs. It goes some of the time to a W, a little bit to Zs, not very often to Taus. And there's a very small fraction of the time it will go to a pair of photons. However, okay, look at this. Uh, I've taken this example, this ZZ, uh, sorry. Yeah, this decay. And uh, sorry, it's not very, very clearly visible. So this is a decay of the Higgs going to a pair of Zs. And then the Zs going to muons. So you see four muons. So this is exactly what I said. The Higgs decays into lighter particles. Those decay to even lighter particles, which are sort of stable. And therefore, you see only those stable particles. You look for those. So that's a typical Higgs candidate. So it was first thought in the 70s and 80s, that the CERN's large electron positron collider, which ran from 89 to 2001, would discover the Higgs. So hopes ran high, but because this was a giant accelerator which smashed electrons and positrons together at a variety of energies ranging from 90 GV to 206 GV, but the upshot was that no Higgs boson signals were found. All that could be said was that if the Higgs had mass less than 115 GV, so that's where he is, huh? then it would have been found. So now we have a slight uh, sort of range is beginning to narrow down a little bit. It was 0 to 700, now it is 115 to 700. That's not a great improvement, but it's still something. However, the LEP, data from LEP also provides strong hints that the Higgs boson could be light, in fact, somewhere below 200 GV. That's because the LEP also made very precise measurements of the masses of these W and Z bosons. And those get small corrections, sorry, 
those get small corrections due to the Higgs boson. So if you make a very precise measurement, then you know exactly what those small corrections should be. And you can use that to put an extra constraint. And it turned out that because of those precision tests, you then knew that the mass would have to lie somewhere between 115 to somewhere about 200 GB. So this little range, this white range left, is 115 to 200 GB. Now, you didn't need to take this very seriously because in these quantum corrections, if you had any kind of other thing other than the standard model, any, any new particle could wash out this result. So it was not a very serious result. But at the same time, if you believed in the standard model and didn't uh, take any other new kinds of physics, then the mass was really restricted to this range between 115 to 200 GV. All right, so that was what we knew. Then came the Tevatron at Fermi Lab. Well, and they had much more energy than the Lab Collider. However, in the end, the result was not very successful. They were able to rule out this small little, I'm sorry, a little sliver in the middle, about 10 GV in the middle, was sort of ruled out. So now you see that from uh, 0 to 700, we had the range sort of narrowed down to somewhere between 115 to 145, and again from 160 to 200 GV. So it was narrowed down to two windows. So if I take the analogy, then now we knew that the tiger is not anywhere in the jungle, but it's somewhere in one or two of these areas. Sorry. However, at this stage, many people began to worry that the Higgs would never be found at all. And among them was famous Stephen Hawking. And he bet that, he bet, well, he didn't bet a lot of money. He bet a hundred dollars that the Higgs boson would never be found. And he has just lost his bet. Okay, so uh, you can see from this that though he was worried, he was not very worried. Otherwise, he would have probably bet more. <laughs> However, other people who didn't go for bets or who don't have the money because they have not written bestsellers, so other people simply wrote papers on how you could avoid it. So there are lots of suggestions of Higgsless models. So I don't want to go into details, but lots of people had lots of ideas. And these so-called Higgsless models, they have only two common features. When you go through them, in my opinion, they have only two common features. One is there is no Higgs boson. And of course, and the other is that they are all very contrived. In fact, they mostly require multiple hypotheses to solve a bunch of problems which the Higgs model does in one go. So if you have the Higgs, it solves all the problems A, B, C, D, E. But for each of these models, you have to make different hypotheses to solve them. And that's very ugly. So since we have found the Higgs boson, we don't need these Higgsless models. And in my opinion, that's good riddance. We don't need to worry about them anymore. Okay. So now, of course, you want to know how the Higgs boson was found. So, at this point, I have to introduce you to the LHC. Well, you've probably heard a lot about it in the press and so on. So it's a giant particle accelerator like the others, but it's the biggest <coughs> one till date, where bunches of protons are accelerated to this figure uh, of 4 TV are made to smash into each other. So basically what happens is that you take bunches of protons and keep smashing them into each other. And when the, when the bunch crosses each other, some of the protons happen to collide. When they collide at these high energies, sorry, then uh, you have new particles produced. I'll show more of this later. So I have to say, say this in, uh, to that. This, this is the biggest scientific experiment, both in terms of number of people involved, both in terms of cost, ever attempted. And this... Uh, so all of this to find a particle which lives for 10 to the minus 21 seconds. Well, not all of it, but well. So this is a picture of the tunnel. This goes around 27 kilometers. That's your uh, picture of the ring. And this, uh, to get a scale, idea of the scale, this is the airport of Geneva. This is the runway. So you see it's really, really, really big. And uh, it has a long agenda with the Higgs discovery, of course, being number one on this. So I won't uh, bore you with details of LHC. That should be done by an experimentalist, which I'm not. However, let me tell you that at the LHC, once about every three lakh times protons collide, for every three lakh protons, once in a while a Higgs boson is created. 
Now when it's created, I'll show you a cartoon of what sort of happens. You have these protons which collide and then break up and the debris goes down the beam pipe and a Higgs boson is created. When I say created, what happens? Some of the energy of those protons is converted into mass and we have this, uh, of course, you know why. And you have a Higgs boson produced. Now I just explained, or I told you some time back, that the Higgs boson is a very short lifetime. So it doesn't survive. It sort of immediately decays to lighter particles, which then decay to other particles. And finally, you see in the detector the signs of, this is a cartoon that shows the, the signs of the other particles. And I'll show you the same picture again. This is precisely what happened. The beam, the proton beams came like this, one like this and one from the back, collided here. A Higgs particle was produced, it immediately decayed to two Z bosons, which also then decayed to these muons. So this is a, this is a real picture of what we saw. Compared to uh, the, the cartoon. So, but basic idea is you look for these Higgs candidates. So, in fact, very soon after it became running, the Higgs was the LHC was able to shut down this upper window. Remember, there were two windows here. Okay, the, this is going to become very faint, I'm sorry. But there's a window here and a window here. And LHC was able to shut down this upper window and keep only a, most of the lower window open. And these results were reported in Bombay last year at the Lepton Photon Conference held in TIFR and it was just about a year ago. So a year ago, all that we knew is that we have we had not found the Higgs, but if the Higgs was there, then it lay somewhere in this little window. Okay, and of course, that was that prompted more people to write more models about Higgsless models because people were very scared that you would not find anything at all. This, in fact, okay, don't, I, don't look too much at this picture. Look only at this part, that where this black line rises above the red, it's still allowed, and where it doesn't, it's all disallowed. This is a, a particular search, so you look at this end. So this is the actual picture which was shown in summer 2011 at various conferences, including Lepton Photon, and uh, this is the allowed range. So the hunt was now in its final stage. The one window had gone away, you were left with one window. Unfortunately, this is also the most difficult place to search for a Higgs boson. Like you can say it's the densest part of the jungle. It's the most difficult place. Now why is that? Let's look at that. So you've already seen this picture. So you see that most of the time, this uh, Higgs boson tends to decay to BB bar pairs, to bottom cores. However, for every bottom quark event which comes from the Higgs boson, there are about 11 crores of BB bar events which come from other processes. So if you are asked to find one person among 11 crores, then that's going to be really difficult. So therefore, it's very difficult to isolate uh, the bottom. And therefore, what you are looking for is basically the Higgs decaying to these other modes, the W or the Z pair or the photon. These are the ones which are easy to identify. and want to look for them. But notice that the probability for their decay is very small. Except for the W, these are really very small. These occur only once in a while. So if you want to see enough to make a discovery, you have to collect more and more statistics. You have to keep running the machine and wait for more and more of these events to occur. And uh, that is precisely what the LAC did. So I'll now cut to December 2011. In December 2011, the actually, this is the same plot as before, but I want you to look only at this region. You see that in this region, there's a definite, the, what is here, this black line has now risen above these yellow borders. So it began to look like there was a signal. It's even clearer from, so that's the loud region. That's what's, that is what was quoted. So remember we started from zero to 700. So now that has got narrowed down. By last December, it was narrowed down to only this 10 GV window. Okay, now another way of looking at it, but there was more to it than just this. In this one, what is plotted here is the p-value, which is actually, it's the probability of your data being a statistical fluke, of it not being the Higgs, but a statistical fluke. Now, if you look here, you see that everywhere else, 
it's uh, it's pretty co much compatible with that. A small probability of it. But here, in this region around 125 GV, the probability of the Higgs going to gamma gamma, this photon photon, is roughly it's only 1 in 60. So the chance of it being a statistical fluke is just about 1 in 60. And that means that the likelihood of it being a Higgs is large. So it's, it's somewhat similar. These are the ruled out regions. So, mm -hmm. so basically you were looking at this region and now you had these little dips here which told you. However, 1 in 60 is not a very good probability. And I found a very nice expression in this one newspaper which says that if you were to board a flight which has a 1 in 60 chance of crashing, would you board it? And of course you wouldn't. So therefore 1 in 60 is still not good enough to claim a discovery. So have you found the tiger? So, well, is it there or not? So, so at this stage, we were certainly better off than before, but it began to look like there was something, as you see here, but uh, of course, we are not sure. You can't be sure whether this is only camouflage or it's only your imagination. Okay, finally, results of July 4th, and, sorry, so here's an example of a gamma gamma candidate, photon, two photons, two photon candidate. And here, again, don't, don't look at details of this, only look at this peak. So here you are well about the expectation or what the fluctuation could be from uh, the other events. And you are well about that. And it's sort of clear that there must be something here, that you are seeing the Higgs decaying. And similarly, if you look at it in terms of probability, now you see that this dip, which was earlier about here, it was about here, has now gone on very far. So this probability of the data being a statistical fluke is now about 1 in 30,000. So now again, let me ask you the same question, that if you get into a flight which has a chance of a 1 in 30,000 of crashing, would you get in? And perhaps we are not so sure. Okay, you may be in that 30,000 flight. You also, there was other process, Higgs going to ZZ bar, that actually gave you a better signal and the probability here is about 1 in 1 crore. And perhaps if that's the probability, then you would take the flight. So this is better, but when you combine everything, it's not, it's still not, it's okay, it's, it's good. Scientists want to be even more sure. <coughs> anyway, we are more sure because this is what we saw in last December and now perhaps we are seeing a clearer picture. So, so now if I ask you, is the beast there? You will say yes. Okay, so that is the situation which we are at, in at the moment. We are seeing something which is clearly something which is not part of the background, not part of the jungle. It is something new. So let's now ask ourselves, what exactly have we found? Okay. There is a new particle whose mass is around 125 GD. That is clear. This particle, we know it has to have spin 0 or 2. That's because it decays to two photons which are known to have spin 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2 or 1 minus 1 is 0. So it could have either one of those. Whatever it is, it has integer spin. So that makes it a boson. And therefore, what we have discovered is a new boson. More importantly, this particle we have seen that it decays to two photons, it decays to two Ws and it decays to two Zs. The other decays have not yet been seen. Now this is exactly what you would expect from a Higgs boson. You would expect that with the data we have now, you would see these precisely these three decays. There will be lots of decays to BB bar pairs, but too much of background to isolate those, to be able to identify those. And for the other decay modes, there is too little yet produced to be able to see it. So this matches our expectations from a Higgs boson. So I'll now give you the other example of a diplomatic statement. The Director General of CERN said that what we have seen is not inconsistent with a Higgs boson. Okay, so it's a careful, cautious statement and you can't fault him for this. Okay, so now what do we need in order to prove that this is indeed the Higgs boson? We would like to know that. 
and I'm sort of nearing the end of my talk now. So, first of all, we have to measure its coupling strengths to the WWZ and so on, and eventually BB bar pairs when we are able to do that, and show that these, not the gamma gamma one, but the others are proportional to the masses of the corresponding particles. Remember, the masses came because of the coupling strength, which is the measure of stickiness. So, if the masses came from that sticky behavior, then you had better measure the coupling and find out that it's proportional to the mass. Once you know that, and you know it's, that you have this full proportionality, then it has to be the Higgs. It has to be this particle which gave mass to all of them. So that would be the proof that we have a Higgs. Moreover, the particles which are very light, it shouldn't couple to those. Suppose you discover that you have an appreciable coupling to the electrons, muons, all these light particles, then it's not the Higgs. So that you shouldn't have a uh, surprise and that's still possible. Okay. So what we have seen, as I said, we have found, uh, as I showed you a picture, but we ne need more data. By the end of 2012, we may be able to collect enough data to do many of those things which I just said, and then perhaps the beast will be out and roaring, and you'll know for sure that we have found what we were looking for. All right, the last item. So, well, if what we have seen is the X boson, where does that leave us? Well, for the moment, nobody is going to make a Higgs bomb. There are going to be no immediate electronics applications from the Higgs. Remember, I'm talking about the Higgs itself, okay? There are spin-offs of spenders, right? Stock market will not be affected. <laughs> Schools, college syllabuses will not include the Higgs person. And I don't think even Bollywood is going to make a film on the Higgs discovery. So why should we bother? So, so what has happened? What has happened to make us so uh, proud? I'll still say that the Higgs discovery is a matter of pride for all humankind because we have learned a very basic secret of nature. The origin of mass in the entire universe, not just mass in our neighborhood, but mass in the entire universe, and we have learned it by the sheer power of human thought and by the power of collective endeavor. It is not, this is a very interesting case, so it's not like, it's not like the days of Einstein where somebody sat with a pencil and paper and figured out something fundamental about the universe. That had to be proved by a tremendous collaboration of people from all walks of life. Okay, because uh, this entire facility of LHC, even the other ones which have contributed earlier, are enormous cooperative efforts of scientists, engineers, computer scientists, and of course support staff who also contribute. I think the person in the Sun cafeteria who makes those wonderful uh, French fries is also has his made his own contribution to the discovery of the Higgs boson. And this, this uh, collective uh, effort, it has shown us that even though we are very small uh, kinds, uh, very small living objects on a very small planet of a very small star, of a very average galaxy and somewhere lost among the billions of galaxies, we are still able to know what happened to the early universe and we are able to know something about the entire universe, sheer merely by the power of thought. And I think that's quite mind-boggling. And in fact, let me express it best in the words of Einstein. The eternal mystery of the world is that it is so comprehensible. And we have just reached a stage where one of the things which was very puzzling and very mysterious has just been explained and we have think that we understand it. So I'll stop at this point. Thank you. <laughs>